simply an if statement in the code, the moral equivalent of an if statement that says, if this configuration setting is true in general, or for this user, or for this you know, phase of the moon, or whatever, run this code, otherwise don't. And what that does is that allows you to branch in code. It allows you to um, hide that new thing that I'm uh, doing under, uh, in, in development um, and not have it be exposed to everybody. But at the same time, it is actually deployed to production, so somebody who's actually trying it out could, could try it out. D does it make sense what I'm suggesting? eBay, um, that, that's one of those great ideas um, like sharding databases that was like independently invented by lots of different internet companies all at the same time with, I think, without any coordination. So um, I know that Google, at least Google and Yahoo and eBay all in, in invented independently this uh, feature flag idea. They all called it different, different words, but it's the same idea. Um, and then they also separately invented the idea of taking one big database and sharding it into smaller databases too, but whatever. Yeah. So how does this uh, rapid delivery concept interact with uh, those occasions that you need to make changes to the underlying infrastructure? Yeah, how does, uh, I'll say it back, how does incremental delivery interact with monster changes to the underlying infrastructure? Yeah, so that's a hard one. And what you, the, the hard thing is that you want to try to turn massive changes to the underlying infrastructure into incremental movements. Um, and it's hard to talk about it in, in general without, like if we talk about a specific example, we could maybe work through how to make it more, um, uh, how to make it more incremental. But um, you wanna do not, you wanna not do a big bang uh, uh, thing there. So you wanna try to, you wanna try to change one thing at a time. So like be scientific about it. Um, and I appreciate, I mean, it, it was a general question. I can only give you a general answer, but um, but we uh, we have done many um, you know migrations between databases and replacement of database X with database Y, and you do it in this you try to do it in this incremental way. Typically, when you do something big, you will often run it in the old way and the new way in parallel, um, and that is a way that you can kind of uh, build up to it. And then once you are comfortable that the new way works, you can flip over. I hope that was, uh, you can, that's actually, a, yeah, that, there's, that, that, com, that combines two techniques, one of which I call dual writing. So you write, usually the painful thing is when you're moving state, right? So you're moving from database X to database Y or database format A to data, or you know, data format A to data format B. Um, those are the hard parts. Um, and you can do that by writing both in parallel, write both the old way and the new way, um, and then feature flag back and forth to like, to test it, um, and then when you're finally happy, you can you can flip it to the new way, but you keep the old way around for a while as a you know as a backup in case it doesn't work, and then finally you can retire the old way. Um, yeah, yes, sir. You can validate hundreds of fixes per day. F fixes, we mean code fixes, not boxes that my company sends. We call them fixes. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, this is particularly what you're saying is, yeah, could, can you do make a hundred code changes, fixes, or features in a day? And you absolutely can. So Amazon releases some crazy number of like. 17,000 releases a day or, some, or something across all their infrastructure, right? So not 17,000 for any one particular product, I'm sure, but you know, maybe tens for, for a particular product uh, or a particular service. Um, yeah, and, and why, why is that possible? It's possible because releases are safe. Why are releases safe? Because we have written automated testing to make sure that they're safe. So all these things build on each other, which is why I kind of, you know, uh, uh, talked about them in this, in this order. So if we write the automated tests, changes are safe. If changes are safe, releases are safe. If releases are safe, I can make smaller code changes, which by themselves independently are safer. Does it make sense? Uh, and that's exactly how you can do more, uh, more releases. You make releases cheap. Um, so again, to bring it, I, um, to bring it back to the kind of lean manufacturing idea, there's an idea of smaller batch sizes from lean manufacturing. That's exactly, it's exactly it. 
Um, how can we get the release cadence, i.e. the batch size, to be much smaller so that individually they're, they're a lot safer? Um, I'm happy to talk for as long as you want. It's 8.20, what's the time check? I have another 10 minutes maybe? 10 minutes, okay great. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time because people probably have uh, families and stuff just like I do, yeah. Do developers monitor the code? Yes, absolutely. So, um, so at Google and at Amazon and at Stitch Fix and at Netflix, um, we don't have developers and operations people separate from each other. We have, um, we have engineers. And so again, in that small four to five person team, uh, you know, we are building an application or a service and those same people are rotating the pager around like if something goes wrong at two in the morning, one of them is the one that's gonna be uh, uh, awakened and, uh, and fix it. Uh, and, and, also, and therefore also um, they're responsible for, you know, build, I was gonna say building the monitoring, more precisely integrating with the monitoring and making sure that, you know, they have instrumented the code in a helpful way that allows them to diagnose uh, issues um, and then uh, remediate them. Um, and then it's probably obvious, but I'll say out loud, then where does that monitoring come from? Well, that's another, that's another team. So another team could be the monitor. If you're in a big company at Google, for example, like there's a monitoring team that builds the monitoring infrastructure and makes it easy to add, easy to in instrument the code and add, monitor and add uh, more monitors and dashboards and so on. If you are a smaller company like ours, that's a third party service that we use, but the concept is the same, right? So the team is responsible for making sure their software uh, runs, is, you know, has high quality, performs well, uh, is maintained and operated. So yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, how do you separate the concerns of service-oriented teams? And you gave the example of um, developer productivity, and you specifically were talking about release or deployment, um, SRE, which is Google's um, model for operations, um, and then feature teams. So uh, I, there are different answers there. So um, for the uh, engineering productivity slash deployment tool team, what that, that team's product is the deployment tool. Right? And we as a feature team or as another service team are a consumer or a customer of that tool. Um, and so our interaction is pretty clean. They provide a tool and we use it. Um, so we don't talk or even maybe ever talk. Um, they provide a tool and, and we use it to deploy. If there are bugs, we report it to them. You know, if there are issues, we talk about them. They are responsible for maintaining the deployment tool, whatever that means, right? Uh, maybe there's some infrastructure associated with it, whatever. Uh, they're responsible for enhancing, et cetera. We, are, we just use it. Uh, in, the, in, the in the form of SRE, which is um, <coughs> Site Reliability Engineering, so that's Google's approach to, to um, operations. There is, organizationally, there is one SRE team at Google, so like, I don't know, 7,000 SREs or whatever, some huge number. Um, but as a practical matter, they are subdivided and assigned to particular feature teams. So organizationally, there's one thing which is like the software, the people that write the software and another people that operate the software. But as a practical matter, we, always, we all sit together um, on the same floor typically and we all work together even though there are, the organizational boundaries don't follow that. Um, so I, I, a, story that I'm, uh, a story that I like to tell is, um, uh, again, when I ran uh, engineering for Google App Engine, we were based in San Francisco and in Sydney, Australia. So the San Francisco team, uh, which I was responsible for, um, we also had to operate our own software. And so we had an SRE team that was worked on App Engine. Does it make sense? They didn't report to me, which I knew if you had asked me, um, but they were essentially our team when we all worked together. Same with product management, same with a few uh, support, uh, same with a few other functions. Um, and, but we all sat together and behaved day to day as if we were all one team. And so much we behaved as one team that when the facilities people in the San Francisco office came to me and they said, hey Randy, uh, can you tell me how you think your team's gonna grow next year and the year after? Because we're trying to do you know, facilities 
uh, space planning. Does it make sense what they're asking? They were super helpful. They're like, you know, just tell us how much you're going to grow, and we want to see where where we, you know, how we're going to grow the office, and do we need another building, etc. And and I told them, and then they said, what other teams do you need to sit near? And I said, well, um, I don't know, you know, maybe uh, maybe we should. We don't really need to sit near the support people because they're always on the phone, so they can be on another floor. Um, we don't need to sit near the developer relations people because they're always at conferences. Um, and that's probably it. Uh, and you know, maybe we should sit with somebody else. And they said, well, what about these people that are in your, in your area? Like, oh, those are SRE, they're us. Like, it never even occurred to me that they didn't, I mean, I knew if they didn't report to me, if you'd ask me, but I didn't ever consider that they weren't part of my team, you know, our, our team. Uh, and then similarly, oh, what about these other people? Oh, that's product management, they're us too. So like, uh, again, even though the, the organizations were sort of entirely like parallel, um, uh, we all worked as one team, so yeah. Uh, great. Maybe it seems like we have five more minutes, so maybe just a couple more. Well, I don't know. Let's kind of move on. Uh, let's kind of fi finish this. Finish this thought. Uh, so yeah. So if I can, if I can release things rapidly, so not only can I make less risky changes, I can also experiment more, right? So back to the earlier question of, you know, if I can make experiments cheap. Um, I will do a lot of them, and we definitely take advantage of that at Stitch Fix. We're, we're experimenting all the time on new things for the stylists, new experiences for our clients, uh, et cetera. And, that, and if you can make uh, iteration cheap, that, uh, that, becomes, uh, that can become a core competency, uh, and you can move faster than competitors. Uh, some things that, uh, uh, some other things that enable continuous delivery more on the technology kind of tool side, um, you know, cloud, another way I would say that is API-driven infrastructure, that really is an enabling uh, capability, right? So if I am able to spin up the machine resources that I need uh, within seconds or maybe minutes, that's helpful. That allows me to roll things out and roll things back very, very cleanly. Um, platforms as a service, like App Engine or Heroku or Cloud Foundry, whether you use somebody's third party or you run it themselves, those are real advantages because they're higher levels of abstraction and simplify a lot of the things that developers were going to do. Um, and then actually, this is this kind of bringing, this is actually maybe a good semi-closing thing because bringing it back to 11 years ago. So one of the things that, you know, again, thanks to Ron for uh, 11 years ago asking me and Dan to talk about the eBay architecture. Uh, that, uh, that uh, nobody recorded the talk part of the talk, but the, um, the slides are actually still available. Um, they're on my slide share. You can also Google for eBay architecture. Um, and so they're, they're around to be found if you have any, any perverse interest in looking at them. The architectural ideas are all pretty much the same. So, you know, we split things up into smaller, uh, smaller chunks. We did a bunch of asynchronous work instead of synchronous work. All these things are, are just the same, they're the same way we would build software today as 11 years ago. But one big thing is different. It was a big deal when Dan and I got up and said, eBay releases the entire site every two weeks. And pe the people in the audience were flabbergasted. They were like, oh my God, eBay releases the entire site every two weeks? That's amazing. And if I can't, got up and said now, hey, eBay releases the whole site every two weeks, people would go, oh my god, every two weeks? You're crazy. Um, there's no, you know, you should, be, you should be doing it multiple times a day. Um, so how far we've, you know, some of those architectural principles are timeless, um, splitting things up and asynchrony and so on. But, you know, this idea of moving fast, um, you know, the bar has been raised by multiple orders of magnitude from what was cool in 2006 to what's cool in 2017. So this is probably a good place for me to pause in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the slides, but I'd be very happy to answer you know, a, a question, question or two more. And uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, so how does, how does continuous delivery affect how the executives look at the uh, infrastructure and the software development process? Yeah, they have higher expectations of us, as they well should, right? You know, uh, in the days, and I lived in these days, where, um, you know, maybe we would, you would release software, one, you know, if it was shrink wrap software, you release it once a year, or maybe a couple of times a year, and like, that was fast. Um, for online software, you know, we can release it multiple times a day, and so several orders of magnitude faster. So, correctly, the product side and the executive side says, wow, well, if you can release things faster, let's release them faster. And, and that's great. Um, that, that works wonderfully. Um, 
I think it's a, it's a win-win. What? Oh, I see. Yeah, what has it done for the monitoring and the dashboards? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so the, the, uh, correctly, the executives have higher expectations about the software we can release. Also, they have higher expectations about the timeliness of their view into the business, right? So they don't have to wait um, you know, uh, a week to see how we did last week. They don't have to wait till we close the quarter you know, to figure out whether we made money or not. Um, they can see that in not actual real time, but like pretty near real time. Um, and that, um, that, has a, that has a lot of nice effects from the business side. So we can, uh, I mean, this is not just Stitch Fix, but like t t you know, companies in the modern world can react very quickly to changes in the market, um, exactly because like, all that data is much more real time available to the business side. Yeah, I hope that's what you're asking about. So what happens to the of post oh, what happens to postmortems? Yeah, we didn't get that far in the t in the talk, um, sadly, but uh, we still have incidents. You know, we still have outages, unfortunately. Um, but that's part of reality. That's actually part of moving fast. Because like, if we never had an outage, it kind of means that we weren't trying hard enough. And that sounds a little perverse, but imagine learning. Anybody know how to ski? Right? If you never fell, you would not be a very good skier. I, I'm not even joking, right? Or any.